Thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Jonathan Discount. I'm VP of Product Management here at High Streaming. I'm told we're the, the second to last session before lunch, so, so hang in there with me, please. So, although we're at a show that's focused on consumer video technologies and the economics of over the top, um, we're going to shift gears here and talk about enterprise video streaming, both live and video on demand. We're going to drill into some of the challenges of distributing video on a corporate network. I'm going to talk a little bit about Hive streaming, and then we're going to give away an iPad. So that's the agenda. So let's set the stage. Um, folks are doing a lot of streaming in businesses today. The most popular use cases we've seen so far are executive communications, including the, the CEO, the all-inclusive CEO town hall or all-hands meeting, uh, training events such as sales kickoffs for a large distributed workforce. Um, other use cases you see include a product announcement, um, video that has to be viewed to comply with a legal requirement, um, or an always popular human resources videos. Um, the workflow for these types of live events is, is one you're probably familiar with. It's very similar to over the top. You've got a camera plugged into an encoder somewhere. That encoder might be a laptop running uh, laptop software, or it could be a, a camera plugged into a rack mount encoder in a studio owned by the enterprise. Um, that encoder is going to push that content into some sort of origin infrastructure managed by a video content management solution. Uh, that will probably have some sort of portal interface to manage. Um, might also have a portal for viewers to view the content. Alternatively, you might place your content on a SharePoint site or a third-party site. Um, that video content management platform will probably also include some linkage into video distribution, where we're going to spend most of our time today. And then lastly, um, reporting and analy analytics are collected during the event so you can watch or figure out who watched what and when. So enterprise streaming is projected to be a $1 billion business in 2015, this year. That's a combination of a number of different categories. That includes on-premises software and hardware, hosted solutions, and professional services. Our friends at Wayne House Research recently completed a survey of over 1,200 executives about their attitudes and behavior uh, regarding streaming video. So that's where we're getting some of this data. Uh, Wayne House found that 40% of the organization surveyed spend six figures or more annually on video. Uh, almost half, 47%, plan to increase that spending. Uh, so overall, the market's expected to grow 20% year over year. So that might not be large compared to over the top, but it's a, it's a good sized market and it's growing. Some other interesting stats Wayne House got uh, about accelerating adoption. Um, last year, 2014, um, one-third of execs reported they watched live video daily. That was up from one-fifth the year before. Uh, and lastly, a couple other interesting tidbits. The top two verticals for enterprise video streaming are technology and financial services. These are the most mature streaming organizations. You're typically doing 50 or more live events a year internally. So when Wayne House asked what was the must-have feature for an enterprise streaming solution, the answers were, were very interesting. The top responses were not about portals, about fancy players, or slide synchronization. The top two must-haves were maintain network security and distribute the video without harming the corporate network. In fact, the two most mature verticals for streaming, technology and financial services, were even more uh, focused on these two points. Uh, they had between 19 and 24 percent of those surveyed would not deploy a system without the, uh, uh, controlling the ability to harm the corporate network. Almost, almost three quarters, or 75 percent, would not deploy or, or identified as a very important feature for deployment. So there's definitely some anxiety around the network when it comes to enterprise streaming. So there's something going on here. It's, it's rather counterintuitive, especially when you're, spend, you're going to spend several days at an over-the-top uh, uh, conference where we're talking about consumers' access to bandwidth, where a typical U.S. family or a family in Europe might have a 25 or 50 megabits connection. Uh, they can uh, have a family of four with teenagers streaming Amazon On Demand, uh, Xbox Live, uh, Netflix nightly, and, and not have a problem. So we're talking about HD, we're talking about 4K this week, we're talking about 8 megabits per second. These are concepts that would terrify people in enterprise streaming. And that's because the, the bandwidth constraints of an enterprise network are far greater than, than actually on, on the consumer side. So. Um, so business connect why is business connectivity more expensive? Why is it uh, you know, dif more difficult? It's 
That, that could be a totally separate talk. Uh, the bottom line is it has SLAs, it's QoSs, um, uh, lower latency. It's, uh, it's a complex question, but the bottom line is businesses have a lot less to work with when it comes to streaming video. So we did a, an informal case study with one of our customers. This is a global customer uh, with uh, over 120,000 employees across 400 offices worldwide. Most offices of this customer allocates bandwidth for have 20 to 5 to 30 megabits, not shared across a family of four, shared across two to 300 employees. In fact, in HQ, where they have fairly robust bandwidth, they, they plan about one megabit per second per worker. Um, in their well-provisioned offices in North America and in Europe, they might plan 0.3 megabits. For, for more remote areas, such as Asia and Africa, 0.1 megabits. So how are you going to stream video over a 0.1 megabit allotment? That's the question, right? Now, there are solutions, and we're going to go through three of those solutions. And they, they break down into three broad categories I'll talk about. Uh, the first solution is to use an innate capability of the network you already own. Um, so you're using your existing network, i.e. IP multicast. If you've done any enterprise stream, you're probably familiar with the IP multicast. The second solution we're going to talk about is deploying an overlay network of caching devices out into your, into your network on top of your existing network. Um, that's also known as an enterprise CDN. We'll talk about that for a little bit as well. And lastly, we'll talk about pure software plays. Um, so uh, software companies have developed software-only solutions to solve the problems of enterprise um, video distribution. And I'm going to break those into two categories. There's P2P-based solutions. There's also UDP-based solutions. Let's start with multicast. So first up, um, multicast is a venerable technology. It's been around probably, probably predates the internet, actually. I think it's, uh, it's, it's 1988. Um, it's supported by thousands of devices. It's the basis of our cable television networks here in the US, IPTV abroad. Um, IP, what, what, net, what IP multicast does is the protocol for transmitting IP datagrams from one source to many in a LAN or WAN. With IP multicast, applications send one copy of the data to a group address. Clients subscribe to that address to get the broadcast. So it's a very efficient way of distributing live video. All of your routers in the network have to be enabled for multicast. Your switches also have to be enabled. Um, once you've done that, the, the profile of live video through multicast is very efficient. It looks like one stream per subnet. Now, that's not all. So there's definitely some benefits here with multicast. It's built into a lot of equipment, thousands of different devices. As I said before, highly efficient for live, but there's an if, and this is a big if. So there are some challenges. Folks struggle with multicast deployments you know, acro across the world, frankly. So what is it that's so hard to set up about multicast? It's probably another good session. Um, basically, what we see is that um, router configurations get dropped, uh, which means multicast falls down in that portion of the network. Um, we also see decisions made about how the application works. So for example, if your enterprise video content management solution is used to doing multicast, but if it can't get multicast, it falls back to unicast. If you have a multicast problem with the network on that day, you're going to fall back to unicast and you're going to saturate the network. Uh, another problem that you see with multicast is multicast storms, also known as broadcast radiation. This is some really hard stuff to troubleshoot. This happens when you have a client that is on a, a network constrained connection. It, it causes many retransmits on UDP. It can uh, flood the network with UDP packets, trying to get back into that web, webcast or whatever event is multicast enabled. Now, another big problem with multicast, it doesn't help with VOD, video on demand. Uh, multicast works when everybody's watching the same thing at the same time. So VOD is not going to help you. Also, it's going to lock you into legacy formats, such as Windows Media, um, flash RTMP. Um, if you're in a, any of the sessions this week, you're probably hearing about HTTP adaptive bit rates. You're hearing about Apple HLS, Adobe HDS, uh, Microsoft Smooth Streaming, uh, Dash. Those are not supported natively by multicast. Lastly, uh, there's no public cloud support uh, for multi multicast. By that I mean no, no sensible um, providers are going to allow you to multicast out of their data center. Now there's a way around this. You can put hardware on site uh, to receive a unicast feed and then convert that to multicast, but it increases the complexity of your solution. So multicast is out there. People are still using it. Um, it does some use cases okay, but it does lock you into older formats. Uh, it doesn't help you out with VOD, and there's, there's the other problems I mentioned. So move on. Enterprise CDN. So when you deploy a purpose-built overlay network or a CDN, um, it actually has two different approaches to handling content because it can handle both video on demand and live, and handles them in different ways. 
With video on demand, you can actually bundle storage with your appliances and your, on your nodes and actually do some very effective strategies for, for making VOD efficient. For example, you can pre-position VOD content. If you know a video is going to come out, you know a lot of people are going to watch it, you can put that video out there early. Or if you want to uh, manage that cache according to the most popular content, you can do that as well. Uh, with live, what the, uh, the nodes of the enterprise CDN will do is a little magic. They'll convert multicast to unicast and back and forth as needed by the network. And so they can actually approximate multicast on the network for live. They add a lot of value with VOD. So the pros here, you get great performance on VOD, assuming you've been able to provision the network uh, with enough devices. Um, you can patch multicast in many ways. You can either um, completely replace it or have it work with multicast to sort of shore up those holes in your network, if you will. The downsides for an enterprise CDN are, frankly, it's expensive. Um, it's a large capital cost to get this thing deployed. There's costs in maintaining the software, maintaining the hardware. There's, ma there's uh, expenses in everything from power and ping to maintaining the employees that will manage this, this solution. So it's, it's definitely something that's going to be a lot more expensive than trying to rely on multicast, for example. Um, it has a long time to value. By that, I mean this is not something you're going to be able to deploy overnight. It's going to take weeks, if not months, if not years, to get this fully rolled out, especially on a large corporate network. And lastly, about hardware restrictions, if you're able to virtualize the nodes of the enterprise CDN, you might be able to get it out there faster. But if you're shipping hardware to the four corners of the earth, uh, you will have challenges. Uh, we've seen that happen as well. So in, in a nutshell, enterprise CDN can do a lot of things very, very well. Uh, the limiting factors are really cost. So the last category I wanted to go through was pure software plays and distribution. Um, and really, the attraction of pure software plays is is the initial traction, which is cost, because you don't have to do anything to the network. You're not, you're not consulting or spending tons of money trying to fix multicast. You're not um, investing tons of money in new hardware for appliances, for, for enterprise CDN. You're going to get a software solution that's going to fix everything, right? So I break down the software solutions into two categories, uh, what I call legacy peer-to-peer -peer and UDP. Um, in peer-to-peer, -peer, um, most of these solutions are typically a full client's deployed out to the endpoints of the network. Um, and what we found, the problems with this, uh, well, let me, let me rephrase. So once you get the client deployed, what will happen is one of those peers will get the video content and it will share it with the other peers within the network. So it, from an uh, ingress perspective, it can be highly efficient. Uh, however, there's some catches. Uh, what we found is that a lot of the solutions out there in the marketplace today are advertising efficiencies based on unicast, not based on multicast. So they're saying we can save 50 or 80 percent of your traffic um, based on unicast. It's kind of a false comparison because you would never try to unicast. So what they're really saying is that they can't reach the efficiency of multicast, but they're getting closer. So th that's a major problem because even if you had 80% efficiency on a network which had several thousand users, you could be faced with taking down, the, taking down aspects of the network. So we don't think that's efficient enough. Um, relaying may be unsecure. By this I mean that some of these solutions they actually push the video content out into their own services and they bring it back. And the reason they do that is to do some packaging around the content. They're, they're trying to optimize it for uh, distribution within their own peer-to-peer -peer cloud. Uh, but the problem with that is that a lot of corporate, corporate um, organizations don't like that. That's a no-no. You're going to push content that's potentially proprietary, uh, potentially private, outside the network. Even if it's protected, they don't like that. Um, there's a focus on legacy formats with most of the solutions in the market right now in the, in the peer to peer space. So there's a limited AVR support, adaptive bitrate. So you're still back to the Windows Media, Adobe Flash uh, sort of world with some of these solutions. And lastly, um, many of these solutions require extensive configuration changes on the network. So although you're not deploying any new hardware, you end up having to modify um, router configurations, you end up having to modify firewalls, um, proxies. You end up having to request from the customer potentially proprietary uh, network information, that's CPNI. You might have to ask for their router tables, for example, or their private address space. So these are, again, these are no-nos. These are things that corporate organizations or large enterprises, they don't like to do that. They don't have to. Now, the other pure play that we see today in the market um, uh, with video is, is built around UDP, and these are there's a variety of solutions out there. Some of them are full clients. Some are browser plugins. Um, these really have a different take on the market. Um, the, 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 what's popularizing this is, a, you know, I think if, if you're following the news, Akamai acquired Octashape, which is a premier provider of a UDP-based uh, solution for over-the-top consumption. So 
in that case, their solution is very over the top focused. So it was actually doing the kind of the opposite of what you want to do in an enterprise scenario. It was maximizing your use of the internet connection. So if you're home uh, behind your 30 megabit connection and you want to get eight megabits, it'll help you get eight megabits. But that's not the case in the corporate environment. You really want to be very, very um, judicial in how you uh, share the content. So these, con these, these solutions really are emphasizing quality over network impact. Secondly, we are seeing them come into the enterprise space. Usually there, there's some sort of integration with multicast with these UDP solutions. Um, the, the only problem that we've seen is that they, they tend to be proprietary. They require some special packaging around the content to work through their protocol. And that can, that can be problematic for integration with the, uh, with the video content management service, with the portable, things like that. So that's a quick overview on how people today tackle that challenge of of video, enterprise video streaming. So I'm going to talk a few minutes about Hive Streaming. So what is Hive Streaming? Uh, Hive Streaming uses excess network capacity you already own to deliver high quality video to every viewer in the organization. Sounds like software, right? Well, it is software. Also probably sounds like peer-to-peer. -peer. It is peer-to-peer. -peer. So we like to actually, we like to call ourselves next generation peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, we take a slightly different approach on the, uh, on our, uh, to peer-to-peer. -peer. We, we do require a client on each, on each viewer's machine. Uh, that client acts as a transparent proxy between the streaming server and the player. That's important because it doesn't change your workflow. So your workflow, however it exists today with encoder, uh, origins, uh, video content management solutions, players, that remains exactly the same. Uh, we also have a, a host of, of services we host in the cloud. We call them helper services. All they really do is maintain stats and they help the peers get introduced to one another, if you will. We never transmit content uh, through the cloud or relay it. So what makes this different? Number one is performance. So uh, I mentioned before that uh, some of the uh, information in the, in the, uh, in the space that, that talks about peer-to-peer -peer talks about 50 to 80 percent efficiencies on live and VOD. We reached 99 percent efficiency on live. We uh, actually aspire to be one stream per subnet, just like multicast. Um, we're very good at this. We do it with a minimal configuration on the customer's network. Uh, we feel this is the best in the industry, and we have an IP patent portfolio to back that up. Now, if you recall, the second must-have reason for um, buying an enterprise streaming video solution was security. Another good factor for us, uh, we keep the video local. We never relay video through the cloud. If the customer originates that video on their network, that video stays on their network. Uh, we encrypt all communications, not only our uh, communications between the peers sharing the content, but also with our helper services in the cloud. We also integrate with DRM, all the, all the DRM solutions out there today, um, we will integrate with those for more advanced security. So if the customer wants to use something like uh, PlayReady or Widevine, um, that's perfectly fine with us. Uh, we're in the business of moving packets, or moving fragments rather efficiently through the network. If they're encrypted by uh, some other protocol, that's perfectly fine with us. So a few other differentiators for us, um, silent testing. Silent testing is a great feature we have that allows us to basically test the effects of a live event on the network without running the event. So what we do is we actually orchestrate a test in the background. Um, no, one, no users are aware of that test. We can record all the statistics and then bring them back to the IT department to say where they might have problems when they run a corporate event. Customers love this feature. Um, we always include this feature um, when we're setting up the initial solution, but we find is that customers come back again and again and they say, can you run another silent test for me? I want to see what happened. We just added uh, new sites out in a Canada, can you please run some more silent tests for me? So we find it's a feature that customers come back to again and again. Uh, we have a standards-based approach to video. So I mentioned some, several other solutions do a lot of packaging, a lot of processing required. We do none. We support all of the adaptive bitrate protocols, or formats rather, out of the box. That's Apple HLS, Adobe HDS, Microsoft Smooth Streaming, and Dash. No modifications necessary to your workflow. Next, we also, we chart and graph everything. So we have a rich portal that has graphs of everything from the number of bits being distributed from the peer-to-peer -peer network versus the origin or the CDN. We've got tracking of viewers in real time. We've got uh, who's getting what bit rate and when. Hopefully they're getting the top bit rate. Uh, we track how peers are peering, which types of peering is occurring, everything you can imagine. All this is available on our portal. But also, these, you know, our intent is that people will use this with whatever solution they already have. So these charts can be placed in a third-party portal, or you can talk to our API directly. 
Lastly, ease of deployment. Um, we still are a client. We do put a client on the endpoints to facilitate the peer-to-peer, -peer, but we require zero changes to the customer's network. We do all of the, we do all the network management through auto detection. We don't require the customer to change firewalls, to change proxies. We don't require their routing tables, anything like that. Everything works out of the box through auto detection. So we think that's a big uh, game changer as well. So, I, th I think I'm running out of time, but. Perfect, okay, so, so who's afraid of a little PDP? So there's still a lot of FUD in the marketplace about peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, people are still talking about Napster, although it happened, uh, what, 20 years ago? Um, so, and, and other things have popped up in the news like BitTorrent, Pirate Bay. I think it's important to look at these from two perspectives, from a business perspective, that when you're using licensed software in your network, that bears no resemblance to a group that might have been using software illegally in some capacity on the internet. There, there's no relation between those two. That's like saying, if you use Microsoft Office in an illegal capacity, why would you use it in a corporate capacity? It makes no sense. Secondly, from a technical perspective, we also bear no relation to these products either as well. So what we'll offer here, often hear from somebody is that, well, my son does BitTorrent. It takes down my, my, my network every night when he does BitTorrent. We've got nothing to do with BitTorrent. We have our own algorithms. We have our own IP. We have our own software. Lastly, I'll point out that all the big dogs in the, in the uh, network space, the, co the, the companies that make all the network hardware, they're dropping a lot of buzzwords today called SDN, or uh, SDN or uh, software-defined networking. So I'm gonna read this to you because I, no way I'm gonna memorize it. Software-defined networking is an architecture purporting to be dynamic, manageable, cost-effective, and adaptable, seeking to be suitable for the high bandwidth, dynamic nature of today's applications. I got that right off the internet. That's exactly what Hive Streaming does for video. So do the research and you decide. Uh, thanks very much for your time. I wish you best of luck in your streaming endeavors.